It reminds me of bodily functions of a variety of types, you know, <laughs> like, like, um, like hunger. Like when are you ever perfectly satiated? Yeah. It's like not a thing, right? So yeah. what you're shooting for is not perfection. You're shooting for optimal. And then by the way, there's lots of signals that your body would give to you when you're hungry. Cool. And then you can eat, but then if you eat too much, then you screwed it up. Right? So it's like, you should eat, but you should eat like the perfect amount. And then we shouldn't like go wild and crazy. But yeah, it reminds me of those types of things. It's like, mm. we want to be tuned optimally given the situation at any given time. Okay. Mm. But like to be in tuned perfectly is not a thing. So much wisdom literature has been like, so much ink has been spilt on this kind of like wise axiom, right? That like peace is not the destination. It's the road that we walk, you know, oh, dear. it's not, it's <laughs> the, it, the journey is where you find the joy, right? That kind of idea, tuning a tuned set of bagpipes. That's not a place you'll ever arrive at. It's an Correct. ongoing process. Yes. Yep. I would call that like the spirit of iteration, Jim. Yeah. The spirit like, of iteration. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I see. I have to be careful what I say because you'll use it again. You'll use it. You know, I will. The pitch time continuum is just a silly, not important name for something that is important to understand. And sometimes a silly, unimportant name is what helps us to remember it and conceptualize of it and think about it. So I can see how Correct. it can be useful. Yeah. Um, it's nice to be able to use as like recall, but yeah, a lot of those things, sometimes Piper's like, well, already off on a tangent here, Jim, we haven't even started yet. <laughs> That's a great but way to get started. Yeah. Just get the juices flowing. Sometimes people will take like the silly names and it's amazing how fast it becomes like this religious dogmatic thing. So fast. <laughs> a fusion is another one. Fusion is another yeah. one that we sometimes talk about at the dojo. That's just a made up word that describes <laughs> just playing correctly. Right. But so many people run around in the world saying fusion, 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 like the dojo, we do this thing called fusion. And first of all, no. Like you're not do you're not understanding it and nor can you do it, but also that's just a made up word. So let's not get carried away here. And the same goes with the pitch time continuum. Th so Jim, is, I ask you, what yeah. is the pitch time continuum? It, I'll tell you in lived everyday life in practical terms, it's the reason why I can't just get the thing done and have it be done. <laughs> Right. I'm reminded of Mr. Incredible at the beginning of The Incredibles saying, I feel like the maid sometimes. I just cleaned this place. Can't we keep it clean for five minutes? I just tuned these bagpipes. Can't they stay tuned for five right. minutes? <laughs> and the answer is no. Even if perfect tuning was achievable, it still wouldn't be achievable because of just like the basic laws of physics. Right? Mm. So anyway, when you tune a bagpipe, if you're serious about tuning, I'm not talking about digital tuner tuning, right? If you're a digital tuner, then you can happily exist under the false idea that you can get your pipes in tune and maybe they'll stay that way. Okay. But that's mm. not real life. Okay. In real life, real bagpipe tuning is something that there is nothing you can do. There's no contraption you can buy. It, like a world record level amount of time that your bagpipe might stay in tune would be like 12 minutes. Like okay. maybe just long enough to get through a short pee brook, right? Yeah. And I mean, like, can you maintain a very high quality of tuning for longer than 12 minutes? Yeah, probably. And by the way, certainly the real long range pee brook players, okay, they can keep their pipes in tune to an extremely enjoyable to listen to degree for maybe 20 minutes or so. But even they would admit, I'm sure, I'm certain of it. Having been like a long range P Brock player once myself, if you are staying in tune for 20 straight minutes, that's a bit of a relief. And then you would also concede that you've had to change your blowing probably fairly considerably throughout right. the performance yeah. in order to keep it in tune. And then also that's a very difficult thing to achieve. And so, yeah, so that's not a thing, right? And I think probably in reality, let's say you reach up to tune your drones, you get everything tuned the way you like. Probably the rolling average all time, length of time that it stays that way would be like mm, 81 seconds. <laughs> yeah, that feels before, brutally uh, honest. Yeah, before a new, before a retune is going to be required. At least if you want to 
be perfect. Now, you can be pretty damn good for longer than that mm -hmm. when, you, when you're trying to go for that perfection and, or that fine tuning. It typically isn't going to stay very long, and it takes quite a while to get to the point where it is going to stay that way. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. where the pitch time continuum, and again, that's just a silly name okay, that we give to how the chanter reads pitch is going to change over time. Okay. So that's, that's the big thing. That's what the pitch time continuum is all about. And the pitch of the chanter read behaves in somewhat predictable ways that it's important to be aware of. Okay. And then I find that the pitch time continuum like does a good job about discussing a couple of key variables that are important to understand. So the, this is the, a graphic of how the chanter reads pitch changes over time. And this is, keep in mind, this is all illustrative. This doesn't use any actual data. It's still, it's still speculative, right? It would require significantly more effort to like actually find scientific data for this. But this just illustrates my experience over many, 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 many years of playing bagpipes and thinking about how the pitch changes. Our x-axis is time, right? Yeah. And then our y-axis actually has info on both sides. Pitch, on the one. Right? Yeah, on the one side, we've got pitch, and on the other side, we've got temperature. That's right. Um, so the temperature inside your pipe bag, okay, directly correlates causes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but directly correlates with the pitch that's going to come out, okay? I think it's probably a correlate because there are other things that participate in the pitch besides just temperature. But yeah, for now, we've got time along the bottom, clicking away. And then on the Y axis, the vertical axis, we have the pitch. So what we'll see is, and everybody knows this. And by everybody, if you've played bagpipes for even just a couple of months, maybe, or if you've dabbled with tuning, even just for a couple of weeks, you'll notice that when you get your drone in tune, it doesn't stay in tune for that long because the chanter read, I'm just pausing just to let people listening in the car, just follow along with mm. us here and. Like lean the chanter in read in tends to increase in pitch over time. That's what the chanter read tends to do, right? And for just for sample numbers, these are not literal numbers. They could be quite different. But for sample numbers, I say, okay, the chanter starts at 448, okay? And then as we play, it could increase up to as high as, I don't know, 456 is what I have on this graph. But so like a range of, a pretty considerable range from when we first start playing to where the chanter read could go up to. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now that's not always going to be the case, but, but that's the basic idea. And then interestingly, the, now you might assume, okay, the chanter read pitch just keeps going up over time, but this is not actually true. Mm -hmm. This is probably the most important basic piece of information to take away is that the chanter read, the rate at which is, it increases is not linear. Okay. Is it actually, is this actually like a logarithmic curve or something? I did math once a long time ago. It's but, been a long uh, time anyway, for me as well. It's not exponential. It's like the other direction. So basically what will happen is it's going to increase in pitch rapidly at first. Okay. And then less rapidly later. And then the reason for that. Almost a plateau, right? Definitely a plateau. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unless there are extreme external environmental variables, it will actually plateau at some point. And here's why. The temperature that you breathe out of your mouth into your bag is a constant temperature. That's the reason why. For ease of math, let's call it 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It's basically just body temperature is the temperature that's coming out of your mouth into the bag. So let's say your bag temperature is going to start at, let's call it room temperature. Just for illustration today, let's call it 70 degrees. But the breath, your breath is at 100 degrees. So what's going to happen to the temperature inside the bag as you play? The temperature is going to go up fairly rapidly, let's say, from 70 to 80 degrees. It's going to happen pretty fast. Okay, but now that the differential is just 80 to 100, the next little bit to go from 80 to 90, that rate of increase will be a little bit less. Right? The rate of increase. It'll take longer mm -hmm. to go from 80 to 90. So now our curve is starting to even out a little bit. And then it'll take even longer, quite a long time to go from 90 to 100. Okay, that's the basic idea behind it. Okay, and then, of course, what happens if at any point along this process, you stop your pipes and stop playing, right? What happens is that the 
opposite will tend to be true. And the pitch of your chanter is going to go down instantly as soon as you stop playing. The temperature inside the bag is going to drop and it's going to go down. Cool. Making sense? Any questions so far? Making sense. Making sense. And now, interestingly, why do we care about the pitch of the chanter read? Okay, here's another crucial point. Why do we care that the pitch of the chanter read changes? The reason we care is that rate of change that we experience with the chanter read, we do not experience with the drones. Okay, the drones might change a little bit in pitch here or there, but relative to the rate at which the chanter read is always changing, the drones don't change a whole lot. Now, we would have to do real science to figure out whether the drones really don't change at all. That doesn't seem likely to me. Mm -hmm. What's more likely is that they do change, but it's just ever like far to a small, to far smaller degrees that mm -hmm. the drones would actually change in pitch as, as you play. Now, why would they change less than the chanter read? And then we could speculate a whole bunch of reasons, but it probably has to do with the size of those instruments. Those instruments are much larger in size and the reeds are much larger in size. And the rates at which they change is probably a lot less. That's just me, non sciencey person, speculating off the cuff there. As long as non sciencey people can speculate off the cuff, I might even hazard a guess that often today drone reeds have synthetic materials, whereas your chanter reed is all cane. That might have some effect too. Mm. Like I'd imagine that plastic However, is not as affected as. But just to criticize that idea, Jim. Go, hey, go ahead. Uh, we find playing all cane drone reads that uh, basically every not a whole lot's different so the, the cane the case, drone huh? reads don't change a lot either yeah and but maybe they do change a little bit more because they're cane who knows again that anybody who can help us create experiments to investigate some of this that'd be great but i digress okay so that's the basic idea so the channel reads changing in pitch all the time now when you blow air into the bag temperature is not the only thing that we are contributing to the system, what's the other key thing that we're contributing when we blow into the bag? We're like increase in pressure, sure. What else? Jim, this is your moment. So certainly moisture. That's gonna be moisture. That's gonna be changing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And we are not going to go into the wet versus dry blowing deep waters in this episode, Jim, but we do have one planned for it. I'm really nervous yeah. about that one. But anyway, on my next graphic here, I've introduced a blue line that represents what moisture, what effect moisture seems to have on the impact of the pitch time continuum curve. And, um, and again, it's, this is all approximate, but what do you notice about the blue line? The effect is not as extreme, the, the uh, by which I mean, by which not the rate might be about the same, but yeah, the ultimate, plat the plateau, you get to the plateau sooner, the plateau is lower. And That's it's right. just not as big a deal. And we all know that, right? So when your chanter reed gets wet, what happens to the pitch? It gets lower, right? Like picture mm -hmm. like a cold and playing on a cold day at a parade or something. Everybody's yeah, tuning totally. really flat and so on and so forth. Okay. And, and then you take your chanter reed out. You're like, what's going on? So oh, the chanter reed's wet and you can feel it's like wet and cold and that's going to contribute to a lower pitch. That's true in moderation as well. So as moisture gets introduced to our bagpipe, Okay, the pitch ceiling that we can expect will decrease. And by the way, there's other really great benefits to wind moisture. <laughs> by the way, most people would say, uh-oh, the chain reed's getting flatter. That's really a terrible thing. Okay, but that's not necessarily true, right? It's only true if you need to be at a higher pitch, but it's not true necessarily if you're not too concerned about the pitch because mm. the, uh, the more moisture in the chanterid comes with other benefits. Now, I'm not talking about soaking wet, saturated chanterid here. I'm talking about a, a chanterid with a little bit of moisture in it, not, not totally saturated. Uh, and that comes with some benefits. All right. Now, benefit number one is that the chanterid's rate of change will now be a little bit slower and a little bit more gradual. And the differential between your pitch ceiling and what the reed would sound like if it were played totally cold, that differential is now less. So I would call that more, I would call that more stability. So with moisture comes more chanter reed stability, right? The rate and the range at which you're going to fluctuate in pitch is now less that you have moisture in the system. Okay. This is why Ross canister bags or other moisture control systems can be really detrimental to your sound potentially. Sure, your drone reads are going to stay dry, but because the whole system is so dry, 
the stability of the chanter reed pitch, okay, is very minimal. It's un it becomes unstable, not in the sense that like your blowing's unstable, but unstable in the sense that if you play, the pitch is going to go up and up and up and up. And the moment you stop, it's going to go pretty drastically down. However, if you can get some moisture into the system, those fluctuations are going to be less. Okay. Which is cool. And I'll just say, Jim, I see you're about to say something, but the other thing okay. I'll say is moisture also improves the harmonic response of your reed. Okay. It makes mm. the blades of the reed a little bit more flexible. It allows things to vibrate a little bit more freely, a little bit more organically. And as a result, you get a nice, full, rich sound relative to a totally dry chanter reed where you can picture like a dry sponge, right? You can picture mm -hmm. like a dry sponge, just trying to be a reed. And it's just, maybe you can get it to vibrate, but it's not going to be nice and rich and full. Yeah. So, yeah. so those are the two main benefits you get once moisture comes into the system. And so as long as you can cope with the fact that the pitch is a little bit flatter, then you're good to go. Yeah. It's interesting to me to think about how when it, it in the spirit of a nine, not again, a non-scientific person having something off the cuff here, it, it occurs to me that water moisture in general, in terms of like temperature can have a, an insulating effect where the out, the non-wet atmosphere might fluctuate a lot more, but within the water, it's not going to be nearly so much a thing. And so maybe put another way, are you telling me that the moisture level in my bag has a mitigating effect yeah. on how extreme the change is in relative to temperature. I think that's what I'm telling you. Yeah. Mm. Yep. So uh, in, yes. in practical terms, two things come to my mind with what, how does this affect my piping? One is it can be frustrating if it feels arbitrary that my pipe major is telling the entire band when we're getting ready to play, when to play and when to stop playing. I might feel like, hey, man, I just want to go in the corner and work on my solo pieces or something for fun until we circle up. But the pipe right. major's being like all controlling and telling me like, no, don't play your pipes yet. Now play your pipes. That can feel very frustrating if it feels arbitrary. But using this, I can go, oh, there's a reason behind why we would yeah. want all the pipes warming up at the same rate as much as possible. Yeah. And it's the same reason you would want everybody in the band to be playing a similar system. And not for everyone in the band to have different setups and things that they like. Because really, we need to, in the pipe band scenario, and by the way, this rabbit hole is infinitely deep, so let's just leave it at this. In the pipe band scenario, that achieving a sound together is a team effort, okay? And, and one of the things that you have to manage as a team is the, this exact same thing. It's like, how are we going to mm. get the chanters not just to tune together, but also to be always at the same point along there? pitch time continuum together. And that sounds real nerdy. No one in top grade one bands has ever said the words pitch time continuum. That's just a geeky name that we made up for this. But it's like, how are we going to manage chanter read pitch over time over 20 pipers simultaneously? Mm -hmm. Ooh, yeah. Gets real interesting. Okay. Mm. So it's cool to think about it. And even just starting to get the gears turning, I think will be great for a lot of pipers. I'll bring up the final image now, which where I've added a third layer of moisture here. And you can see now there's a green line on our graph. Okay. Now this is with even more moisture in the system. Okay. So the blue line was a little bit of moisture. Now the green line is, this is where I picture myself when I'm playing my band bagpipe or the bagpipe that I like to play, right? When I play long range solos, I would go with a moisture control system, which would put me basically on the red line, okay? Mm. But the bagpipe I like to play, the one I would play for gigs, is that this is a great example. The one I would play for gigs is definitely the bagpipe using the green line on the continuum, okay? Mm. Where, there's, where I'm not shying away from moisture at all, okay? I'm letting it in, making it happen. I'm becoming one with my friend, the moisture, okay? Mm. But we can see here now the pitch ceiling is now the lowest of the three. Okay. So our chanter itself, we, we want to set it up so it sounds good at this lower pitch because it's, ne it's never going to get up to that pitch where the red line was before. So maybe a slightly, a chanter that's designed slightly sharper than others might be good for this type of system. Okay. But now you can see that the range between when I'm totally cold and the range between where I level off way at the top of the ceiling, it's a small range. Instead of eight hertz, mm -hmm. it's now four. So I've split the range of possible pitches in half, which is 
really good. Okay. And then you could see that the everything, if it increases or decreases, when I stop playing, for example, okay, the pitch isn't going to dive way back down. All right. The mm -hmm. pitch is going to take its time now. So the rate of change is now going to be less. So this is a much more stable setup. Okay. Stability. Mm -hmm. And I like, and by the way, it should be nice and rich because there's lo lots of moisture for the channery to work with. So I should get a nice full sound. This is what I'm, this is what I'm liking. This is what I'm, this is what I'm happy with. And by the way, this is basically what top grade one bands are working to achieve. Okay. We're working to achieve the maximum harmonic response out of the instruments, which only moisture can provide. We're looking for minimum instability in chanter reed pitch, right? Mm. It's really cool during the March past at the major this last weekend, I just got back. You got to hear that in action, right? The bands will get tuned up and, and then they'll have to stand for a long time without playing. Okay. And then they have to fire up and they have to play six, eight marches. So if you get all tuned up and then you stand around for a long time without playing, you would expect that the chanter pitch relative to the drones, when they fire up again after standing around for a long time, that the chanter reed pitch will be flat. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if these bands played dry systems, they wouldn't just be flat. They would be radically really flat. flat. Mm -hmm. Right. However, because the top grade one bands are playing moisture welcoming systems. Okay. And again, this is all made up in my mind. Maybe I'm way off base here, but I don't think I'm that far off base. But meanwhile, because these bands are playing moisture friendly setups, when they fire up, their chanters are only slightly flat to the drones, like to the point where the average listener probably couldn't tell. It's only slightly flat. And then after maybe one part, maybe a part and a half, the chant, because the temperature is now increasing inside the bag again for us, right? The chanter reed pitch has come up and now it's bang on with that drone number. Okay. Now, maybe if you play a really long time, maybe the pitch of the chanter might even pass the pitch of the drones but not by much. Okay. So mm -hmm. you're, so a good band has got that richness and that stability because of the way that they work with moisture in a really smart way. Mm. Uh, and that's basically what the pitch time continuum is all about. One of the things that you have to do, if you play a dry setup, okay. One of the implications here that you can see on the graph, you can just see it. If you play a really aggressive moisture control system that tries to filter all the moisture out, then it will require continuous playing in order to be in tune for a long time, which is possible, right? So if you take somebody like Bruce Gandy or these top soloists, what they're doing in the tuning room before they go on is playing continuously. They got to get that pipe mm -hmm. all the way up to the pitch. Okay. And then by the way, you want to minimize the amount of time you have to stop your pipes to say hi to the judge and whatever, before you start playing. And then those really long tuning times that you have, before someone starts playing their P-Brock, right? That's what that time is then used for, is to get that chanter read back up to that optimal pitch where it's not going to change anymore, okay? And you want that to last for your full 20 minutes. And it's wild and crazy, man. And by the way, if you're buying into any of what I'm saying, it would also be instantly apparent that a digital tuner is not going to be the solution to this problem, is it? Like the digital tuner has no awareness of any of this, and in the time it would take you to make an adjustment to your digital tuner, in many cases, the channel read pitch has already changed so much that the variables are just going to start to get really confusing and not workable. So there you go. Pitch time continuum. What do you got for me, Jim? What, what else do we need to know? I think you, you cover really well. I think that the one other thing that is of like very practical interest for any of us listening to you talk about it is how this affects us when playing by ourselves, aside from with a band. I can tell you a very embarrassing story of a Christmas concert I did once where I had been in tune at home when I was getting ready. Yeah. And then I went to the event and before the event started, I struck in and started playing and was still pretty, pretty well in tune, but then there was more time. And so I went to a green room and just for fun kept playing for a while yeah. and as i kept playing for a while i went oh my drones are off and i readjusted them played for a little more and i went oh they're off again adjusted them again and then they said hey yeah. time for the show to start so i go and sit in my spot for about 45 minutes until it was my time to play go out on stage so low and sounded 
horrible, like so yeah. like embarrassingly horrible that I did everything I could to shorten my solo so I could get off that stage and drive home because I was yep. so ashamed <laughs> how terrible yeah. it sounded. Yep. I have a very similar memory. It was, it would have been like 2003, maybe even 2002. It was one of my first years playing with the SFU pipe band. And we were doing like a big session where we were, everyone, we were working on getting all the pipes locked in. And whoever was before me in the process was taking a really long time. So I just kept playing and playing and playing and playing, waiting for my turn, you know, trying to sound great for my turn. But because of all that playing, the pitch had gone up so high and it was way more playing than you would ever do on the day of the worlds or anything like that. So the mm. pitch had gone up so high that everything was just a hot mess. And like, it was ultra embarrassing. I'm probably lucky I didn't get cut. Yeah. Uh, but, but I just remember kind of like being scolded for rightfully for just overplaying and just not paying any attention to how much I was playing relative to others, because yeah, that's the game, right? We want to tune ourselves so that we sound great when we perform. Right. Which mm -hmm. in different situations can be different. Another example would be, let's say you're playing a funeral, right? And there's going to be a half an hour break between when you tune and when you need to play. Okay. Yeah. You're a little bit of knowledge of the pitch time continuum can go a long way there. All right. So we can play a moisture friendly setup. So play your pipes a little bit at home, get them kind of acclimatized, get some moisture in the system, get things the way that you want to go. And then what I do is I basically never play for more than 30 seconds. That's the secret. That's my secret. So once the pipes are acclimatized, so while I'm acclimatizing the pipes, I play for more. I play five, 10 minutes just to get the juices flowing in the bagpipe. But then what I'll do is I'll let the pipes sit for five minutes, right? And then I will strike them up and bring them into tune in about a 30 second period of time, right? And, you know, maybe, maybe 60 seconds is fine, okay? Cause you get them in tune and then play, just play a little bit of a tune, making sure everything's sounding great. Then I let them sit for five to 10 more minutes. Then I pick them up again to make sure they still sound good. And if they don't, I do some small tweaks on the tuning, but like I do that three or four times at home before I leave for the gig, just, you know, 30 to 60 seconds, tune them up. And what you should find is hopefully you get to the point where you pick them up 10 minutes later and they're still perfectly in tune. Right. Mm -hmm. So basically I'm not letting the pitch of the chanter ever get up high. And then what I do when I go to the funeral, guess where I warm up? Where you're going to play? <laughs> I know. See, I skipped the whole warm up altogether. Oh, of course. So I see. At it, home, was, it, was, it was a good question. <laughs> right. I, I don't have to worry about where I'm going to warm up at the gig because I've gotten myself confident enough at home that my pipes are going to sound great after long periods of sitting. Right. Yeah. And if I get the chance to toot my pipes, I will. But if I don't get the chance, I'm not that stressed because I've done this process that I trust. Now, granted, there's a lot of little variables in there. You just have to be careful. So if you yeah. put your pipes in the back seat on the way to the gig and the sun beats down on them really hard for a half an hour drive, like that's going to be a problem. So you got to think through some of that stuff. I just put my pipes fully put together in the car with me. You can't put them in the box because then obviously they'll be detuned as you take them apart. But again, it's all fairly related to that problem. Mm -hmm. Now, when you play at the funeral, let's say I play for more, I have to play for more than 30 to 60 seconds at that funeral, right? What's going to start to happen? The pitch of the chanter is going to surpass where the drones are. And yeah. that is going to, that is going to be a slight problem, right? So I just find that most funerals, you got to play Amazing Grace maybe twice through. So that's maximum of two minutes of playing. And uh, so you probably are going to see your chanter climb above your drone, but the idea is to mitigate this difference enough that it's still within the realm of pleasant, even yep. if not perfect. Yep. And you can always feather, right? So once you start mm. to go past the, you can always feather, but you can't do the opposite. And by feathering, so technically speaking, it's not ideal because whenever we decrease the pressure, the tonal quality won't be quite as great. But once the chanter read surpasses the drone read in the number, we could s do slightly less blowing pressure in the bag to bring the pitch of the chanter and the drones closer together. That's what I would yeah. call feathering. You can call it whatever you want. Doesn't, it's another ridiculous name. However, you can't really go the other way, right? Mm. So let's say you get to the gig and you screwed it up and your chanter is way below the drones in pitch. If you just try and overblow to get yourself up to the drone number, 
you can't really do that. The chant read will start to sound all wonky. You'll get squeaks and squawks and so on and so forth. So yeah, for an advanced player who's able to sense that their chanter read has gone over the drones and pitch, a little feathering. Sometimes I heard, I've heard Richard Parks refer to it as like sympathetic blowing, perhaps it would be another way oh, yeah. of thinking about it in the sense that you hear your drones are different to you. So you sympathetically adjust your blowing in order to match it, which I kind of like that term. It's cool. Yeah, but, but I digress. Someday uh, when there are entire like, like church state bagpipe countries at war with each other, it will be the doctrine of the sympathetic blowing versus the doctrine of the pitch time continuum. And all of the crazy, zealous acolytes who have followed the weird cults that you have established in your life will, um, will be killing yes. each other over this. I mean, it kind of already happens uh, to an in extent. In the internet right? comments? It's like, yeah, yeah. And uh, in the internet comments. And just, yeah, I don't want to go down. No. Yeah, no but the So the moisture control systems that emerged in the mid-90s? I don't know, like the Ross canister systems and the like, it's an incredible technology, but it also just radically changed people's relationships with their instruments, especially beginners and intermediates. The, your relationship with your instrument is now totally different and it's totally shielding of the truth of the matter, which is that moisture is a key ingredient, right? So a lot of us are, have played with total elimination of moisture on the mind where that is not going to get you a great sounding bagpipe. It'll get you something that sounds very, very good, but, but not great. And by the way, that's a trade-off. That's a trade-off some soloists are willing to make, right? It's like, well, right. if I can be very, if I can sound very good and have a guarantee that moisture is never going to form on my reeds then that's a trade-off I'm willing to make. Mm -hmm. That's what I think we see in the long-range solo playing, right? And by the way, synthetic drone reeds participate in this change of relationship that people have with the bagpipes as well, because if you get a tiny little bit of condensation on a cane drone reed, it's no big deal, right? But if you get a tiny drop of condensation on your synthetic drone reed, that could be a total deal breaker. Oh, I've had my synthetic drone reeds turn off completely in the middle of a memorial service during the winter because right. stuff got wet. Just my drone's gone. Nothing to do about it. Yep. Yeah. So there's a lot, there's a lot there. There's a lot there, but that's the idea of the pitch time continuum is awareness of how, who, what, where, why, when, and how your chanter read pitch changes over time as you play. And we would probably all do well to just set our expectations in a realistic way and not imagine that we're ever going to achieve perfect tuning, at least not for more than about 1.5 seconds, because yeah. it's just always moving. And that's part of the joy. That's part of what's so cool about this mm -hmm. instrument. Earlier at the very beginning, when I referenced long range players that can stay in tune for 20 minutes, that would be with probably considerable feathering in the at least the last 40 percent of the performance right yeah, yeah probably i suppose mathematically scientifically it's possible that you just get that pipe at 100 degrees and everything is perfectly stable but i'm i don't know how often it really works like that and it's a difficult game to play and let's just leave it there for now a lot there's lots for folks yeah. to soak in there yeah yep. pitch time continuum people